So, uh, welcome everybody. This is the fourth, fifth week of the Dhamma Talk series this year, uh, here in Bangkok. Uh, so this is the uh, yeah, 2011 Dhamma Talk series, and we've been talking about uh, emptiness, and how emptiness uh, works with meditation, how it works with the different uh, Buddhist teachings. A couple of weeks ago I was pointing out that all the teachings in Buddhism are not true. They're not the truth. They're not reality. Uh, Buddhist teachings are just models. They're just constructs. Things that we can pick up and use in order to take you to something, to some real experience inside yourself. So we don't, uh, we shouldn't, we do, but we shouldn't argue and fight about the teachings. And swallowing. Actually, the Buddha said, somebody asked him, why is there war? And he said, there is war because of one reason, sense desire. And then he added a second clause, he said, unless you're religious, and then you have wars over your opinions. These teachings of Buddhism were not supposed to be um, things to fight over. Uh, they're constructs, they're just a, a useful and helpful model in order to take you to a real experience. And so each of these teachings is designed to take you to a point where you can't go any further, where the mind stops still. Uh, in Zen they have this very nice Zen koan or paradox. And if a man sits on the top of a hundred foot pole, how does he perceive? And as I'm sure you all know by now, if you've been coming, uh, the answer is he can't go anywhere. This is what happens in the mind. If you are going to give up all your concepts, all your constructs. If you're going to completely find something that's totally different, you have to empty everything out first. So if you get a cup of coffee and you want a cup of tea, and you can't just pour tea on top of the coffee because you, you just get a mess. And you would empty the coffee out and then you can fill it up with tea. So it is that meditation or a goal of Buddhism is supposed to give you uh, a completely alternative way of being, a way of seeing, a way of understanding. But you have to give up everything else first. And this is a little frightening in some respects. Giving up all your beautiful constructs, all your beautiful ideas, your concepts, your thoughts about the world. The idea is that you get back to this point of equipoise, a very sharp equanimity, awareness. Now this can be experienced in different ways to some degree. Professional dancers, professional athletes, tennis players, maybe artists, martial arts. There can be all kinds of different ways where you, you hit into a zone. Somehow the conscious mind stops still and you leave everything to the unconscious mind. But when the conscious mind stops still, it becomes brighter, sharper, more awake, and more alert. Uh, it doesn't become like a zombie state. It doesn't uh, get duller and duller and more and more sleepy when you turn off the consciousness. So I would offer up as an explanation what emptiness is, or this, this point of being in the zone, the perfect Zen moment, where everything happens fluidly. My way of explaining that would be that this conscious mind stops still. So if you're a tennis player, for example, you have to practice all your tennis moves. But when you finally get to the um, playing in Wimbledon, in the championship, you can't be thinking about all the stuff that you learn. You just have to get into that fluid moment where it comes together and it all works. Same with boxers. I, I'm actually more interested in boxing than tennis. But the way that they train people is you have to do reps, which are repetitions. There's only so many ways you can swing forward and there's only so many ways that you can develop. And you do these over and over and over and over again, thousands, tens of thousands of times, so that when you get in the ring, you don't have to think. The body just acts automatically. Is the emptiness or being in the zone of uh, arts and sports, is it the same or different than meditation? Are the intentions different? Is the experience different? I'm open to ideas about that. Personally, I never did any sports. or Because <laughs> I'm from England and it's cold outside. You know? you know, we only play things you can do in a pub. And you know the this game Tippet? where you have a, a balanced uh, peg and you have all these weights around on this peg and it's in balance and you have to take weights off it and if it falls over you lose. It's called tippet. 
And the British are the world champions of this thing. Um, we like that because you can do it in a pub, you see. You can drink beer while you're playing cricket. So I'm open. I mean, people who've had uh, experience of extreme exercise or, or uh, performing arts, if we, say, if we can say like that. To get to this point, you have to empty it out. You have to be emptying out all your constructs. If you're sitting there thinking, about what you have for dinner or some insult that somebody gave to you, but you're in a boxing ring, you're going to get beaten. You can't be in the zone and still be carrying around all these concepts with you. This doesn't mean that you're dumb or you're stupid or you believe in somebody else, but it means that you have to empty all of this stuff out. Sometimes people don't like it. People like stuff to think about. And in Buddhism also, sometimes I've given some of what I think are the absolute best talks, you know, really pinpoint talks about these meditational states. And then people have said to me, oh, I don't like that talk. Nothing to write down. I want words that I can write down and remember. And six of this and the eight of that and the four of this needs a blending with the three of that. And then people are happy because you, when you feel like you've learned something, you feel like you've progressed, you actually get a hit, you get a physical hit uh, of hormones in the body, a rush, when you feel like you've figured something out. There was a man in the scooters who was um, like this, his name, if I remember rightly, Vacha Gota. And he would always go to Vacha Gota, right? He would always go to the Buddha and, you know, the Buddha would say, just be empty. And Vacha Gota would say, yeah, but who created the universe? And the Buddha would say, doesn't matter, and, you know, do meditation. And he said, yeah, yeah, but is this stuff permanent or impermanent? And he'd say, well, don't worry about that. And he's Vacha Gota, but, but is there a self or isn't there? And, he would always ask these kind of questions, kind of comic character in the scriptures. Now, of course, if you avoid those questions, you get accused. Like, oh, you, you know, you're not, um, you know, you're, you're avoiding the, the great questions. I had a good friend of mine who's a Christian, and he said, well, okay, in Buddhism, how did the world begin? He's like, I don't know how the world began. He said, cop out. <laughs> you only know the middle bit. You don't know how it begins and how it ends. You're like, nor do you, but um, <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> the analogy was like a man who's shot with an arrow, and the arrow goes in, and the surgeon comes over to, to help the person who's been shot. And the person who's been shot says, well, before you take the arrow, arrow out, who was it who shot me? What was his name? What clan was he from? What does he do for a living? How old is he? Does he have any brothers and sisters? And, of course, all that is beside the point. You just need to get the arrow out. So this is the Buddha's answer to Vacha Gota. He said, all these questions that you're raising, they might be interesting questions, but they're not going to help you with the task. And the task, uh, certainly in Buddhism, uh, is enlightenment. So what is it that makes you grow spiritually? What is it that takes you towards enlightenment? These are the really important questions. So being able to ask the right question is extremely important. Does anyone know the story of Parsifal? The opera? Wagner the opera? Wagnerian? Wagner's last opera? He was uh, the knight of the round table and he went to the Grail Kingdom and he, he, he saw the ceremony with the Holy Grail. But he failed to ask the right question and he was thrown out of the Grail Kingdom and he has to wander for years and years and years out in the wilderness, tormented by what he'd seen before he finally uh, asks the right question and then he gets back to the Grail Kingdom and becomes the next kind of god. So this idea has actually been around for a long time. It's very important to ask the right questions and not get caught up in the wrong questions. And if that's a cop out then I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Because I don't know how the universe began. Um, I don't know what happens to you when you die. I don't know if there really are heavens and hells. Uh, all of these kind of questions. But I do then have to empty out. And when you're emptying out, the thing that disappears is the concepts. And everybody lives in a conceptual world. Uh, whenever you see something, you don't really see the thing itself, you see your concepts about the thing. Coming into this room now, if you've ever done any theatre, you'll probably notice that these big boards, you know, how they're a little bit wobbly, because they put up, how, how would you erect something like this in the middle of a room? If you've done theatre, you're used to doing 
scenery kind of work. If you're a printer, you'll probably notice it's quite expensive to print out these big pictures. Uh, it's getting cheaper these days, but it, it's quite hard to print big pictures like this. If you're an architect, you'll notice the interesting room and the, the roof that goes up in the middle of the room. Um, if you're a sound engineer, you'll notice the acoustics. So just coming in this room, what, what is your experience of this room will be different for everybody. Right? Same when you look at a monk, or, or if you look at a Buddha statue, what are your expectations, what are your views and opinions about monks and what monks should do? These are the concepts through which you view the world. And your all your concepts, they work. They're good enough for you. If they're useful for you, then you use them. But we don't attach them as being the, the truth, or I know the truth, or you know, my views are right and everybody else is wrong. So these concepts then, that you make up, that you carry around with you, start to make sense. They make sense of the world. And sometimes they actually don't make very much sense, but they do to you. Like Paul McCartney, uh, who used to listen to Screaming Jay Hawkins. I think it was Screaming Jay Hawkins. And one of the lines in the lyrics of one of the Hawkins songs was, What is it? What is this in a box? Paul McCartney couldn't figure out what is a wood of that. And this troubled him for years. And then later on they got famous. And they went over to the States and they met Screaming Jay Hawkins. Uh, uh, John, Ringo and George kind of bowed down at his feet. Wow, you're the, you're the master, you're the icon, so happy to meet you. And the first thing Paul said was, what does wood in the, wood in the box mean? <laughs> and this is the thing that would be troubling him all these years. And the actual line was, would all my clothes fit in a matchbox? Now when you hear lyrics like that that don't make sense, you make sense of them after a while, right? You make the song make sense to you. And then it starts to take on a meaning. So layer after layer, you think you've got it all figured out, but actually you realize that you don't. And your concepts are like this. Um, they make sense to you, but if you really start to look at them, the world doesn't make quite as much sense as you think it does. And so the point is that the conceptual world that you live in, you start to question. And your concepts are not, in Buddhism, are the things that you have to let go of. In psychology, it was also the same. A um, very great psychologist called George Kelly, my favorite psychologist, invent invented personal construct theory. This is also his theory. You see the world through a set of concepts and constructs. And depending on those constructs, depend gives you your experience. So if you're having a bad time, what you have to do is not change the things in the world, you have to change your thoughts and concepts, the way that you relate to the world. He called these constructs, uh, which I've spoken about before, uh, he called them expectations. These are expectations of how the world should work. And as a monk, I'm given an extra set of expectations. The expectations that people have uh, about monks and monks' behavior. And I always find it very funny because as a religious person, you know, we're supposed to be telling you what you should do. But most of the time, people are telling us, right? They're saying, you shouldn't buy bicycles, and you shouldn't buy computers in Pantip. And one of the ones that actually frustrates me in Thailand is monks shouldn't run. And <laughs> There's four things that shouldn't run. Kings, elephants, monks, and what's the other one? There's another one, Thai person. Four things? I can only remember the three. Okay. And it's frustrating when the bus is 20 meters ahead of you, and you know just like a few little hops and skips, and you could get the bus. <laughs> and you're not allowed, because I have to, you know, I have to walk slowly, it would be very dignified. Pantip Pratt, you shouldn't buy your computer stuff in Pantip. Where else do you buy it? Well, 7 Eleven doesn't sell computer stuff, you have to go to Pantip. Um, so, this is a set of expectations that people have on monks. Right? So, when I first ordained, I didn't know any Thai, and the Thai monks were trying to teach me Thai. But they would teach me Thai like they would teach a child, and not like they would teach a monk. So, every time, every day, without fail, 
uh, whenever we went to for lunch, they would always say, all right, mate. Every day, I went, all right, cat. And we were trained in doing this over and over. And even like hours later, they said, did you go for lunch yet? All right, mate. All right, cat. You had to do this, this ritual. And then one day I was walking past the lay people. I didn't know they were very high, so lay people, and they're eating their lunch in the temple. I said, Arai Mai. And they're like, What's this mother? <laughs> what was <laughs> the expectation that I was given by all these people teaching me Thai? I didn't know you were not supposed to do it to lay people. And the other thing was, when people feed us food, <laughs> When people feed us food and they say, is it good? We're not supposed to say, all right, man. Because you're supposed to be a monk and you're supposed to be a communist, you see. And then somebody said, uh, uh, how is the food? And I said, all right, man. And the monk said, you can't say that, can I? But so you've trained me to talk and now I'm, I'm doing it. We're not supposed to say food is aroi. Aroi means delicious, if you don't know. Um, because you're supposed to be a monk and detached, you see. So I said, well, what do you say then? They say, you should answer the... Somebody asks you, is the food okay? You say, the... it's good. And then this other monk said, well, you have to train the lay people up so they know what kind of food to give you. If the food's not very good, you say, ah, and the... But if the food's good, you say, oh, the man. <laughs> <laughs> these little games, these social rules and expectations of uh, how people are supposed to behave. And this is your conceptual world. You live in a, in a conceptual world. And when you really look at it, especially when you've come from one culture into another culture, you see all these weird things in the new culture that, that just don't make sense. Uh, we have one, the monks aren't supposed to carry the bag on the shoulder. And this one monk, he, he came out from my university, and he, he, I don't know how to do it politely, but he coughed up a big and there's one spat it on the floor. I'm looking at him, and then he points at me and says, you're not a good monk, you've got your bag on your shoulder. I'm like, you just spat on the floor. <laughs> That's my set of expectations, my beliefs. Anyway. So, where was I? So what is really happening? How, is there any way to be completely without concepts? And this is very difficult, because normally what people do is you, you change one set of concept, concepts to another. So you became, become a born-again Christian, or you become a... you become a Buddhist, so you become a meditator, and you get all these... you get a new set of ideas, knocks out your old set of ideas, but all you really got is another set of concepts to work with. None of these are coming towards this point of quiet, of equipoise, of equanimity, of emptying out, vibrancy, alertness, awakeness, presence, that we're trying to develop in meditation. So is there any way to be without concepts, without constructs? Basically, if you're going to interact with the world, there isn't. You're going to always going to have to have a set of concepts. But you can choose and you can change your concepts and pick ones that work for you. If you listen to wise people and wise teachings, uh, if you consider carefully and you make a determination to, to follow what's wise and good, then you can make, better set, make a better set of concepts. But to go to that point that's beyond concepts, that is possible. That's not to say that you can live in the world without concepts and your constructed world. But it is possible to be free of it for a few moments, to see the freedom from it. And this is what I've been talking about over the last few weeks. I'm going to do a very quick recap. Any moments of perceiving, any moments of perception, your mind will focus on one thing at a time. And with that thing will be both a physical form and also mental aspects to it. The physical world cannot arise without the mental, and the mental world cannot arise without some physical form. So, for example, if you think about democracy and try and hold it in your mind, you can't get that in your mind without the word. The word is uh, a sound, okay? 
Now you may not say it out loud, but you're saying it internally. So that's the sound, that's the form of the thought. But you also have your liking or disliking, you have perceptions around the word, what does it mean, is it good or is it bad, do I want it, do I not want it, when did I experience it before, etc, etc. All your past history with the word. Uh, you also have your background mind state, are you happy, are you sad, are you alert, are you uh, dull? And you also have consciousness is wrapped up on that word. While you're thinking about democracy, you're not feeling the feelings in your right foot. You're not listening to some sound that's going on, some air conditioner or somebody behind you. You're only focusing on one thing at a time. Now suffering can only arise on that thing that you're focusing on. If you don't pull something into the mind, you can't suffer over it, according to Buddhism. I question whether that's actually true or not, being a psychologist. But according to Buddhism, uh, you can't suffer on something unless you put conscious attention onto it. So two weeks ago, one of uh, the students in my university, in the class I teach, she gave me this big bag of Indian goodies. Uh, so I, put, I was on the bus, I got the bus home, and sometimes the bus, at the end of the route, it goes on a little bit further, and if you sweet talk the driver, he'll let you off a bit further along. So I went to sweet talk the driver, and I asked him, I said, hey, you're going to go up there and turn right. You know, that little hopeful look you have on your eyes when you're asking for a favor. And he looked at me and he looked away. No. <laughs> what? Oh man, no, he didn't need to do that. So I was a bit grumpy that he was grumpy, right? So I, I stomped off the bus. And as the drunk bus is pulling away, uh, I remember I left my bag of Indian goodies on the bus. And I couldn't run to get the bus bag, I could I? <laughs> <laughs> could have run after that bus. Now if I think about it, it kind of annoys me because this driver was a bit rude. If he'd been really nice, I'd think, oh well, he, get, he gets a nice bag of goodies. But the fact that he wasn't very nice, I'm like, yeah, can I get a motorcycle and go after him? Uh, Maybe when the bus comes back in the morning, it will still be on the bus, in the back. Maybe you won't see it, etc. So this image arises in my head, something that causes me suffering that I don't like, the driver getting my bag of stuff. Right? Now in my mind it appears as one thing, just like the image of the bag. But to hold it in my mind, I have to start thinking about it. I have to start thinking about the details. Otherwise it will just vanish from the mind. So I have to start thinking about the driver, about whether I liked him, about what he could have said, or what I could have done, or how stupid I am for leaving it, etc, etc. I have to keep throwing, using thought to throw my attention back onto this topic. So I think about it and I feel bad. Not that bad, but it's my example. <laughs> if somebody insults you, or they steal from you, or they accuse you of doing something that you haven't done, etc., you can fill in. Uh, and also, it's, also it is, it's the same with your own body, if you're feeling pain and suffering in the body, illness. It's the same process that goes on. You suffer about it when you throw your mind back onto the topic. When you call it into conscious attention, then you can suffer over it. Even a pain in the body that might be there the whole time, you only suffer about it when you call it into conscious attention. So this is the process that we're looking at in, in meditation. One thing arises at a time. It will arise with a form, either a sight, uh, either external or internal. You remember a sight, remember something that, that you've seen, a beautiful person that you're attracted to, or um, in my case, a beautiful new computer that you're attracted to. So you can either see it externally or internally, or a sound, or a word, or a thought, or a feeling. As this arises, it rises with all the mental factors together with it. You can't have just the sight without the liking or the disliking, without attraction or non-attraction, um, without the mental background of the state of the mood of your mind. And then it disappears. So what we're doing in meditation is we're trying to watch this process. And rather than relating to yourself as this big world of concepts, constructs, that you can never rearrange into perfection. My children, my wife, my job, my health, getting older, my money, all the rest of it. You can never rearrange all these concept, concepts, this conceptual world, into just being perfect. 
And if you can, it doesn't last for very long. You might get a few moments where you just think, ah, oh, this is great. And then things start to unwind usually. When, when something arises then in the mind, what you see is it arises by itself. Things occur to you rather than you actually thinking about things. So when you meditate, something pops up into your head, and you're like, where did that come from? Right? Some advert that you saw when you were a kid. Nuts all hazelnuts, ooh, Cadbury's take them when they cover them in chocolate. You have to be English to know this one. Um, where does that come from? I saw this when I was like 12, and uh, it was an advert on the TV. Everybody's a, everyone's a fruit and nut cake. <laughs> Any English people remember these things? Okay, one or two. So something literally occurs to you when you do meditation, it, it pops up into the brain. Now because you're determining to remain mindful, to remain still, and just to remain watchful, you start to see the mind operating under its own steam. And this is a very different way of seeing your own mind. When you see thoughts coming up by themselves, thinking themselves, and disappearing by themselves, you're experiencing yourself in a very fundamentally different way. And a lot of people who consider themselves intelligent, capable human beings, and yet when they come to do meditation, they're like, I just couldn't do it, my mind is all over the place. So what's going on? Are you the boss of your mind or aren't you? Is the mind yourself or isn't it? When you're viewing the mind in this way, well, this is what we call non-self. In Buddhism, it doesn't mean you don't have a self. It means that you view yourself as non-self, as a process that's going on rather than something that you yourself are doing. So you see something arise in the mind, some thought, some feeling, some memory. I remember the, the guy on the bus eating, picture him sitting at home, filling himself on all my Indian goodies. <laughs> And I start to get a bit annoyed, but I feel that come up and as an object. I'm like, why did that come up now? Why, if I absorb myself into it, then what happens? I get caught up in that idea and that emotion. This in Buddhism is called the mind going outside of itself. And a few people were being confused about this. When you get caught up in a thought, according to the Buddhist construct, it's only a model that we're using, but that's you going outside of yourself, because you're getting lost in some kind of object. You're getting lost in thought, in this case. If you hear the sound of the banging upstairs, and you think, why are they doing that? What are they doing? Then you're going outside of yourself. You're losing the awareness of yourself, and you're getting the awareness of that thing. So it's time to watch this process over and over again. It gets quite fascinating after a while, because it goes on by itself. The mind does all these things completely by its own steam. So then, uh, you can feel the attraction of whatever it is that's arisen in the mind. You feel the attraction to putting you into it. This is what I talked about last week, satisfaction in something. There is a satisfaction in thinking about stuff, in engaging in stuff of the world. And if there wasn't, people wouldn't be attached to the things in the world. But there's also a misery involved, there's also a discomfort involved. And that is that you lose the sense of yourself. Now, the more you gain a sense of yourself in meditation and the, the awareness, the more that you can touch the zone, the more you realize that in that equipoise, in that stillness, anything that arises that tries to draw your attention to is a form of suffering. It's like discomfort. It's not suffering like pain and sorrow and, you know, and that kind of suffering. Nothing you'd write home about. And, oh, Mum, you know, I had such a terrible time, I had this thought that occurred to me about a man on a bus, and it didn't stop. Sometimes things don't stop, right? They get into your head, and, and they, they go on and on. And I just had this one with a song, and it, I heard it 15 years ago on the radio, and I, I, it's been in my head for 15 years. And um, I just found a site where you can listen to it online, and so I listened to it 200 times, and I finally got the song out of my head. Why does something like that stay in your head? It has that attraction towards it. It makes you want to think about it, want to engage with that thing. And if you see the dukkha involved, if you see that it's actually not that nice being sucked in away from your meditation, that this pristine stillness is a lot more comfortable, 
you start to separate. Now what you're doing is something arises into your attention, into your mind, either from the outside or from within your own head. And so you hold yourself back, you don't find yourself going into that thing. Now, this is just one moment. This isn't a philosophy that you apply to your life. Non-attachment, you can't apply it to your life, it won't work. Right? Being attached to your children, your kids, your job, your health, I mean, in a worldly set of concepts, constructs, non-attachment doesn't work. Yet it's a central part of Buddhism. Yesterday we went to see Ajahn Jayasara, one of the famous monks, and uh, joined here, he took a nice picture of Ajahn Jayasara and I talking. And he posted it on Facebook, and he said the two wise men discussing wisdom, something. And actually we weren't, we were talking about iPads. <laughs> <laughs> now if you ask Ajahn Janisaro, does Buddhism teach about non-attachment? Yes. Is non-attachment a good thing? Yes. Do you have an iPad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> give it to me then, you're non-attached. <laughs> He's not going to give you his iPad, right? This whole idea of non-attachment isn't about things in the world. Uh, the whole idea of non-attachment is something that you do in the immediate moment, and you feel yourself being pulled, your attention being pulled away from mindfulness into some thought, some feeling, some idea, and you restrain yourself. When you restrain yourself, you're, you're detaching from this process of continually being caught up into this conceptual world that we live in. That's what non-attachment really means. When you see it in meditation, it makes perfect sense. So, you, you're watching this process, and what happens is, in meditation, the mind gets caught up with something, and then you realize after 10 minutes that you've been thinking about something. You say, okay, mindfulness, mindfulness, and then the mind just falls asleep. And then after 15 minutes, you're like, ugh. And then you feel that meditation is horrible. The reason it's horrible is because your mind is still asleep. It's groggy and it doesn't move and it's not bright. I this meditation really sucks. So you keep trying and you keep coming back to the breath. And then every so often what happens is uh, the mind disengages and you get a few moments before it re-engages in something else. And then you just like breathe. And then you realize it's quiet, and then you, you're not used to being awake and aware without thinking, so you think up something quickly, like, oh, my mind's gone quiet, oh, that's a thought, and then you've it's all gone again. Just for a few moments, you experience that. That peaceful awareness. So this is why we use the technique that when, when you find yourself caught up with a sound that's going around, do you like the sound upstairs earlier? You go, hearing, hearing and you bring your attention back. When you get caught up in a thought, you go thinking, thinking, and you bring your attention back. When you get caught up in a feeling in the body, you go, ah, feeling, feeling, and you bring your attention back. Okay. So then after you start to notice some of these in-between moments when you're not caught up in something, at first it's a little uncomfortable, like anything, when you're not used to it. Right? Uh, but as you get used to it, it gets a lot more comfortable. Any new experience is always a little bit disconcerting. So when you experience the mind that isn't doing anything, isn't engaging in anything, it's a little disconcerting. You're like, you know, I want, I want to do something instead. So you dive into a meditation object, breathing, breathing in, out, rising and falling in the summer. But that's not it either, because that's just another object that you're looking at, right? Instead of thinking about the man on the bus, or suddenly what you're thinking about is the breathing. The breath is your physical form, it's got a feeling to it. It's got liking and disliking, in this case neutral, it's got mind states behind it, um, it's got perception around the breath. Now it's a very plastic, peaceful object, or a mantra, or lights, or anything like this, any of these meditation objects. But what you're doing is you're just diving into that. In the same way as in regular life, you dive into normal things, stuff to entertain yourself. The mind is used to doing it all the time. And since you're kids, you've been practicing doing, doing, doing. The mind has been drawn outside of itself. Nobody ever teaches you, well, what, what does the mind look like when it's not doing anything? No idea, most people. 
So then after experiencing concentration on your meditation object, you come, even when that stops, you come back to this moment again of the stillness. And after a while you realize the stillness is what we're doing in meditation, not the concentrating on a breath, or the light, or the mantra, or something like that. Now the more you settle into it, what happens is the mind starts to become aware of itself. You could say aware of awareness, or mind being aware of mind, mind being aware of stillness, you can call it Buddha nature, call it all kinds of different things. It's a little bit like, if you just shine a light around the room and say what you see, you, you count all the objects in the room, and completely miss the fact that you're seeing light. Light is the one thing in the object, that you, in the room, that you never see, right? So the same with the mind. Whenever the mind is doing something, there is this background of awareness, but you never notice the awareness. When you're disengaging all the time, you're disengaging from the stuff of the world, suddenly you get this vision of the light of awareness is right there the whole time. Now that is really interesting. That awareness is really bright, it's really beautiful, it's pristine, it's clear, it's pure. And this is why in Buddhism, we're not just saying the world is rubbish, don't get involved with it and sit in a cave or under a tree or something like that. There is something a lot better. And when you start to turn the mind around and see the mind seeing the mind, seeing the mind or the light of the mind or the awareness of the mind, this is real meditation. This is when you start to really get glimpses that change everything. Then you start to see your concept, all your conceptual world that you live in as just concepts. And you still get caught up and engaged in it. You still get annoyed at the man on the bus. But very quickly you see yourself, the idea coming up, you see yourself being sucked in, you see yourself let go, and then you remember the awareness, and things start to work themselves out. It starts to get quite clear to yourself which direction enlightenment lies. But people ask me, what's enlightenment? I don't know, I'm not enlightened. But I know which direction it lies in. The clarification, the stilling of everything like this starts to make things really bright, really clear. One well, analogy is like the world has uh, like um, creepers growing over an old ship or an old boat or an old house. You see this in the canals, here you on a canal trip in Thailand, in Bangkok. And the creepers have grown over something and the house or whatever it was has long since disappeared and the creepers are just stuck there. This is actually the Buddha's own description, he said, so your concepts creep over the world and strangle the world and ended up, end up in a matted knot, in a tangle. And yet to bring the whole thing crashing down, you only have to cut at just the right place. And the right place is this, this point of awareness. When you see the light of awareness, the whole conceptual world comes tumbling down. Now you really are seeing a way of being free from concepts. Now, as soon as you reenact in the world and talk to people, you're going to be working back through your concepts again. You're going to be having attachments again. Uh, and that's normal, that's the way that you engage in the world. But you've got this um, background feeling that there's something else, there's something different, there's a different way of being. Seeing that then, all the teachings that we have in Buddhism, all these great teachings, are just tools. And once you see this awareness, then you see just how attached you are to the world. Just how insipid this process is of things sucking your attention into them. How beautiful it is when you keep your attention with yourself and you're just awake and aware. And you watch this process, and the more you watch this process of stuff coming up, pulling your attention into, disengaging from it, occasionally glimpsing the, the brightness or the light that we're, that lives behind it, this starts to break all your attachment, it starts to work on you. So the actual Pali phrase, Sabhe Sankara Anichati, any set of mind states that arise is impermanent, it's changing. Now impermanence, when we talk about permanence in Buddhism, it doesn't mean like things are impermanent, like my car's impermanent, my camera's impermanent, it's going to break, my car's going to get scratched, my body's going to get old and ill, that's like, duh, anybody can tell you that. Impermanence, the Buddha said, the impermanence of the body is easy to see because after 
50 years, 100 years, you get old, you get sick, sick, and you learn, and your back becomes crooked as a roof rafter. But very difficult it is to see that the mind is impermanent, because you have this permanent concept of yourself. Even the concept changes, but you don't realize that. When you're watching the mind in this manner, it starts to become clear, like everything, nothing stays in my mind for very long. So you sit and watch that process. As you watch that process, you get tired of it. Yatta banyati patsati. Okay, like that. <laughs> when you view this process with wisdom, banyaya is with wisdom, patsati is to view, to see. Atta nitimdati dukke. You get sick and tired of suffering. Esamako visukhiya. This is part of purification. So you're watching this process in meditation of the mind picking something up, being sucked in, you feel the attraction, you can feel the letting go, occasionally you get this glimpse behind it, you get sick of the suffering. Next slide. Sade uh, Sankara Dukati, any mind states that you can create are a form of suffering. When you see this with wisdom, uh, you get fed up of suffering. This is path of purification. Why is it suffering? When something arises in your mind, if you're meditating and you're still and you're equipoised and you're bright and you're aware, and then what shall I have for dinner that pops up in your mind? Right? You start, there's an attraction towards that. There's an attraction in that. But if you go into that thought, you realize that it sucks you in and you have to keep thinking it. You have to keep thinking another thought about it. So you maintain that perception in your mind. And that's a continual movement that's pulling you along after it. And that's the meaning of dukkha, suffering. It doesn't mean suffering like pain and sorrow. Uh, it means the suffering of just being caught up with a mind state. Again, we talked about this three weeks on the second week. What is that suffering? Dukkha is like a wheel that's off center. It's not quite straight. It's always going to be shaking you. He said, in one who is shaking, there is no progress. There is no holy life. In one who is unshaking or unwavering, there is calm. If there is calm, there is dispassion. If there is dispassion, there is relinquishment. If there is relinquishment, there is peace. If there is peace, there is concentration. If there is concentration, uh, there is in somebody, there is awakening. And if there's awakening, there is nirvana, enlightenment. You can compare the stillness that you find in meditation with being caught up in thinking about stuff or being engaged in stuff. And you realize that disengagement is a very beautiful thing. Sapay dhamma anapati. All the dhammas are not self. Any one of these things that arise, any moment of perception that arises, is not you. Because it disappears, but you're still here, right? You've thought about dinner, and now you're not thinking about dinner. But you're still here. The next second, you're looking, you're focusing on the sounds around you. Well, then the sounds disappear, but you're still here, right? So anything that's arising in the mind, you see it disappearing, you realize that that's not me. There is something that is me that is completely separate, and completely different to all of this. This is non-self. Doesn't mean you don't have a self, doesn't mean you don't, doesn't mean you have an ego and you've got to squash it and bash it out of existence. Because that's just more ego, right? What it means is when you're viewing it in meditation in this process, you see that this mind isn't me. There must be something else that is more stable. So the Buddha, when he was uh, practicing, this is exactly the way that he practiced, it's exactly the way that he taught. He was looking around for something called the Amata, the deathless. The deathless or immortality. Now that doesn't mean that the body becomes immortal or you become immortal. That's not going to happen. What it means is you look at everything that is mortal, everything that changes. That's not the immortal. Now according to the legends in India, it came from the Aryan people, there was something, there is something called the deathless, the amata. Something that doesn't change in your experience. He went and searched for that and he found it under the Bodhi tree, and that's what he taught. He taught many, many teachers have taught since. 
There is this background experience that lies beyond or prior or deeper than all the stuff that moves. So, Sabhe Dhamma, Anatati, all Dhamma, anything that you can put your mind onto, that's changing. That's not enlightenment. Yatha, Vanya, Yapasati, if you see that with wisdom. Atta, Nibhinda, Viduke, you get fed up of suffering, of being shaken, of stirred. Esa, Makka, Visudhya, that is the path of purification.